Hey, thanks for tuning in to episode 18 of the Ross Trevino Project. Today's guest is an artist of drawing, painting and furniture. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you JC Clayton. What was your living situation like from childhood to whenever you left Swindon? Pretty crazy, to be honest. To put it simply, we we're probably pretty feral. Was the uh, easiest way to put it as children. Is that, what do you mean by feral? You know, we're sort of almost all over the place, a little bit wild. Well, we we're sort of um, park south area, but we moved all over the shop. We never really settled down as kids. Okay. How many different places did you live in? Four... I think so um we never really settled down it's only when i came out that i wanted i actually settled down but uh when i was in swindon it was pretty diabolical like, as a child trying to grow up in a world that you're trying to make sense of it's pretty impossible to try and make sense of anything if you don't settle down oh interesting what was the sort of vibe of swindon versus wantage in regards to like socially swindon sort of um it's a it's a very large town it's like you know, it's one step away from being a city. I think it's actually only missing one item to become a city. But the cathedral. And like, <laughs> yeah, but it's got everything else. But like the population's quite big as well. There's pockets in Swindon that are very, very, very rough. Like, by rough, you can imagine the worst and you're probably a little bit close to where you should be. But yeah, I'm sort of glad I moved out of there, really, and then uh, came to Wantage and started uh, started off on my little journey, as it were. So where did the decision to leave Swindon come from, from a family perspective? Well, we had to move. Uh, basically, it was uh, quite traumatic and, uh, you know, cars having windows smashed. Um, living in a state where you're constantly bullied and beaten up on the way to school and the way home from school, you know, just a pretty crazy shizzle. So were those attacks personal to you as a person, or just because you weren't friends with them? It basically, it's like um, gang culture, Swindon, because it's on the verge of city. Pockets of people sort of clung together and so if you were uh, new in the area or if you didn't fit the uh, perspective of what they perceived you as then uh, you were an easy target uh, savage it's mainly personal really so um my mum decided to move us to my nams and then uh which was wantage based and then we uh started uh from scratch again as it were so uh Pretty much until 12, I was manically all over the place. Oh, wow. So that was the first stability you felt you had was once you moved to Wantage. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we were coming back and forth from Wantage all the time because my nan lived here. And like it was good, parks and that, and freedom. Room to breathe. But, um, yeah, no, Swindon was a bit feral. It was a bit crazy as a child. I wasn't a place to grow up, that's for certain. Uh, did your siblings ha- find the same kind of, of trouble as you did? Stephen and Adam, thankfully, were young enough that they didn't have to um, deal with it. But me and Darren, me and my older brother, were at the forefront and the brunt of it, really, because we were basically into secondary school. Um, had the full force of pubescent teenagers trying to prove themselves. Oh, fuck it now. So do, you said you moved a bunch. Did you go to different schools? Uh, no, well, me and Darren moved to uh, Wantage, started at KA's, because um, Adam and my younger brother were uh, still at primary school. They moved when they changed over to secondary school. Oh, okay. So their transition was quite easy, but whereas ours was pretty rough. That's interesting. So were they living... They were still living in Swindon and then you were living in Wantage with Darren. Oh, I, d- I wasn't aware of that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Until mum moved to Wantage after she got transferred. Like, my younger brothers were in Swindon and me and my, me and my older brother were in 
one age. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, how long was that in between you moving and me meeting you? I don't actually remember meeting you. Did we meet like almost soon after you moving to the school? Nah, so uh, came to one age, met a few people. Sort of, it wasn't until 13 that I met you. Bonded with uh, you guys and made a band, didn't it? Yeah, we did. Uh, me and Steve discussed being in a band with you. So you have come up before. So remind me, were you already playing drums or did you start playing drums to join the band? Well, it was uh, on a whim, really. <laughs> so uh, I think you guys already set up a band and you were looking for a drummer. And then uh, I was doing paper rounds and stuff to um, you know, to get funds. And then you were like, oh, we need a drummer. Do you want to be the drummer? I was like, all right. So I saved up, shed loads of money get my first drum kit i think it was about 300 quid and i was only earning 15 pound a week for a paper round fucking hour so it took me a couple of months to save up i think it was including a bit of birthday money or whatever but in the end i uh bought out this 300 quid for this drum kit and then uh that was how it started really wow it's just sort of obviously you guys were started musically you had guitars i think uh ian Myself and Steve all had guitars, and then Kevin was in at one point doing vocals, but then he soon moved out, mm. and then uh, started from there. So that was uh, my first flair of artistic license. You seem to pick up rhythm really well. It was almost coming naturally to you. Like you'd only had the drum kit like a month or two before we. I remember doing the first practice with you, and you'd just come up with this. Mad, mad drum beat where you use like every symbol <laughs> yeah the thing is i'm very practical so drums to me i mean it's very sort of set out you know four bars four beats per bar and all that so it's very um drums is a very sort of practical instrument to learn once you get your head around the basics it's really easy to then take it forward and it was a physical instrument so again it's very hands-on you know it's very sort of physical in every sense it's like a, a workout on an instrument in, a, in in effect were you always physically fit before that then yeah i mean I, I used to go like long walks as a kid i used to go out on bikes and stuff i used to skateboard and do all sorts of things as a kid but uh, mainly, it's all crafting. So I, I used to just, you know, the, the instruments or going making stuff or building stuff. Like I used to, you know, lug massive lumps of timber to all the bases I used to build. So, uh, oh, fuck, yeah. So in regards to fitness, I was quite uh, agile, nimble and flexible and quite fit. But... Um, it's mainly because all the stuff I was interested in was actually going out and getting out into the environment and doing things. <laughs> Involved dragging wood around. <laughs> yeah, I used to go miles and collect bits of timber then build these crazy tree houses and bases and forests. I remember you had a skate ramp. Did you build that or buy that? I built it. You built it? Yeah, I thought so. That's crazy. Like, one issue was going under development back then and there's loads of odd bits of timber here, there and everywhere. And so, uh, I mean, I'd go out and buy a bag of nails or whatever with my pocket money and then um, just build stuff. Did you have the tools already around the house? Well, I just nicked my mum's hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and I nicked my mum's hammer, got a saw and then just set to it, just started building stuff. Oh, shit. Uh, that was my escapism, as it were. I'd just be able to go somewhere or go do something and just start building stuff out of scraps. What was the first thing you made from wood, do you remember? I made some Pokemon things in, in my old school. I made these, like, discs, Pokemon discs with, like, hand-painted little images of Pokemons, and people were, like, wanting to buy them. Ah. I should have made a killing, but I was too proud of them to sell them on. Were they, like, the Pokeballs? Well, no, they were, they were like, wooden discs, but, like, with um, hand-painted Pikachus or, like, painted Pokemon critters on there. And like they're actually really good. Now I sort of think about it, they're all right for uh, considering I was twelve or whatever. And like uh, people were really keen to buy them, I should have made a market for it. Yeah, made a killing. You should have just kept making them. 
Yeah, so that was sort of. Um, I used to make stuff loads of times. Anyway, I, was, I remember making stuff in school, that like, like crazy stuff that people wouldn't necessarily think of, out of lollipop sticks and you know all sorts of crazy stuff. Like, I was always brought up on Lego and just like being crafty. So anything that you could make anything with was being made. And also the old uh, Art Attack, Neil Buchanan. Oh, fuck. I loved Art Attack, yeah. Good old Neil. Banksy, isn't he? Neil Buchanan. Is he Banksy? Is he? <laughs> <laughs> There's a rumour. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so funny if he was. <laughs> There's a rumour that Neil Buchanan was Banksy, but I think he put that to bed. I still have an inkling. Yeah. Uh, Neil, <laughs> Neil Buchanan was like a childhood hero. Just be able to get some uh, toilet roll tubes and a bit of paper mache and make anything do you remember zap yeah it was like a cut uh and he was like the painter in that ah fair it is. i sort of briefly remember it. i didn't realize i didn't put the two and two together no uh, yeah so art attack and anything like that i was watching as a kid i wasn't really interested in any of the mainstream stuff i was more interested in actually doing stuff making things creating things i've always been sort of creative as a kid so you've got a very like almost analytical brain you can look at saying and be like oh that would be good for this yeah i have a bit of a weird mind and people struggle to get around my mentality <laughs> and they struggle to get around my abruptness probably because uh, as you said i'm sort of i analyze everything very quickly i think it goes back to my traumatic childhood in some respects so i had to like make quick decisions or whether i was going to get beating the crap out of or wasn't I going to get beaten the crap out of and, you know analysing those things and also making stuff and having very minimal things to make stuff with Were you ever in a situation where you had to quickly find something to be a weapon that was around you like a kung fu movie? Uh, no but I remember <laughs> like <laughs> Stupid question <laughs> There was a, a point where we were in this abandoned warehouse and uh me and my brothers uh, were prattling about and then this group of thugs came in and started chasing us through this factory. Oh, and it was a bit like a Kung Fu movie because we're jumping through ceilings and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Did any of you get yeah. caught? <laughs> no, we uh, managed to evade the uh, capture. So it was like a Jackie Chan movie. <laughs> You're like monkey ninjas. <laughs> It's just crazy stuff like that. But yeah, that sort of all added to my um, my mentality, I suppose, now I'm older. So uh, I can look at something, I can sort of take it apart very quickly and then put it back together in my mind and then come up with a solution, like, rapidly. Oh, that's super interesting. My biggest problem is trying to explain how I've come to that conclusion that quick someone who may take longer to analyse it. Do you struggle with actually explaining stuff then? I've got better at it. I've got a lot, lot better at it. But um, cause with a with painting, with a drawing, it's very quick to um, demonstrate something on paper. As long as the person looking at it understands sort of basic principles of drawing. Um, I do get people that just you, you put something on paper and they just goes over their head. But um, so usually, if I can't explain it, I'll draw it and then sort of take someone through that aspect. But yeah, it, it was a difficulty trying to explain things to people. That, but then uh, I sort of now getting a bit more mature about it. It's interesting because my job is as a project manager to tell people how to do their job in an artistic way. So you found like uh, just being in the working world has helped with your communication skills? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just getting out there and just being with people and doing stuff like that is the best way of doing that. Developing communi communication skills and stuff like that. But I'm, a, I'm basically I'm a draftsman, so I have to draw fitted furniture and um, bespoke furniture, really high-end stuff, you know, stuff's worth quite a fair bit of money. And I got to quite quick, quickly, rapidly get something as an idea onto paper, into production, and explain 
for the people trying to make these things, the process and what these things are and do. So uh, it all helps, but uh, very interesting method of working. Oh, nice. What came first, the art or the woodwork? Well, it was the art because um, obviously I was limited as a child to woodwork because uh, obviously sharp things and children um, don't go very well together. <laughs> but uh, you know, I've, I've always been into art, always drawn as a kid, always painted, you know, crafted, sculpted, anything like that. Uh, always done as a child. And then... As I moved through uh, secondary school, obviously woodwork was introduced. And then uh, we were making some quite cool stuff in our woodwork classes, um, using all sorts of mach- machines and hand tools and you name it, and making some interesting stuff. So uh, it's really good going into secondary school and actually exploring those things. And then um, I sort of led on to... Uh, Deciding to do a woodwork course in college, furniture design and making course. Ah, nice. So that was where you started enjoying woodwork was because of school. Yeah, it's secondary school at KA's really because uh, they had a decent facilities, which sort of goes to show the importance of having decent facilities for people like myself. You know, as much as being academic and having books and stuff, a lot of the time half the population needs to actually physically be practical, you know? Actually, it needs to be hands-on. I mean, even in science, you can't just expect to learn things from a textbook. You actually need to get down and start making things and experimenting with things and testing things. So uh, that was my key sort of thing in secondary school. We had double technology. Yeah, I was just about to bring that up. Um, so you were in double technology with me, which let's explain to the folks at home, uh, is basically if you weren't picking up like a second language very well in like French or was it Spanish, the other one? Or was it German? I can't remember. French and German. It might have been German. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing it was in German instead of Spanish because Spanish is such much a much more uh, spoken language throughout the world rather than German. Yeah, I suppose it was just... Uh going back it's predated text and it's predated stuff you know i mean chinese is probably the most important language <laughs> um at the moment i mean if you want to go forward we should have been learning chinese back in the day because now yeah mandarin you, yeah. Have, you know <laughs> all mass productions abroad um you know it, it makes sense to do that and it's quite a difficult language, so if you started picking it up in school, it would have been quite cool. Yeah, I imagine so. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, what were we just saying? Oh, yeah, and instead of the language, you'd yeah. have the option of doing another session of tech instead. Yeah, that was it. So uh, it was called Resistant Materials. Well, that was the name of the class, was it? Well, it was design technology, but it was mainly resistant materials or whatever was the sections of those and basically it was all the naughty kids and all the kids with learning difficulties <laughs> yeah it was it was interesting though but yeah to be fair right because some people actually enjoyed so you had a morning session you have an afternoon session so anything you made in the morning you could finish off in the afternoon and so uh obviously yeah, there was a mixture of naughty kids who didn't want to do anything and there was like people that actually enjoyed hands-on stuff but like the people like me and a few others in the class yeah we sort of almost put the naughty kids in line i was gonna say i don't remember there being that much disruption in that class compared to other classes what was the cause of that was it because they were saying to entertain people well no a couple of times like uh i remember someone flooding the sink (laughs) and uh they did it deliberately and me and a mate were like, what are you doing? Like, honestly, like, don't even bother. You know, you, you sort of stop in the class. We want to get on. Oh, I think so from, they got called on from that shit. point onwards, it was like, oh, yeah, actually, sugar. I think realisation came when they realised that the whole class was actually enjoying the session and he was the outsider in this and, unless he bucked up his ideas. 
wouldn't get very far. So I think it was more of a group effort in in honesty. Everyone just sort of got on with it and enjoyed it. Yeah, it was super interesting. It was one of the better classes, I thought, as well. And for the point you made earlier where it's actually hands-on and you're not, like, sitting there and you're almost in your own world as well. Yeah, you can get lost. I mean, we were allowed to do anything. We'd, uh, There's a lot of freedom, yeah. You do a sketch or drawing of what you want. And then um, there was a, a stock of materials out in the back cupboard. And then uh, they just let you away. So you had, like, a metalwork section with... Um, blow torches and <laughs> brazing and so you know one one week i'm doing brazing mounting metals and setting stuff on fire and then the next week we're doing like intricate woodwork cutting joints and mortars and tenons and stuff like that yeah it was a great idea for a class did you know if they carried that on after we left well i went to ka's um before they knocked it down oh it's not even there anymore uh, <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, and uh, <laughs> I felt pitiful, to be honest. Oh, really? For the children, because what I saw was um, some of the text and paperwork from when we were children were still being used. So in the maths classes, there were like these um, geometric pictures, diagrams, like basic geometry. Yeah, yeah. And uh hadn't changed since we left, and that was like, was it? It's like a ten-year gap between actually doing those sheets and them me seeing them again in the school just before it's getting knocked down. So unless they didn't take our stuff down ten years later, yeah, they literally hadn't changed any curriculum or anything adjusting to modern needs. That's mad, isn't it? I wonder how long it was there before we started. But that's it, isn't it? It's crazy, isn't it? That is mad. And uh, also in the woodwork department, some of the um, good tutors and teachers had retired. And then uh, some of the equipment that was really, really handy and needed had been replaced by whiteboards and pull-down screens. Oh, okay. So the practical side of things was gone you know the uh hands-on experience was being fizzled out by screen time it's a bit like you know modern uh, the, the issue with kids nowadays is screen time isn't it mm. so like practical things being being able to go out climb trees and build things and dig holes and do all those mucky things are gone those days are gone and they're being replaced by Screen time and old mentalities. That's interesting. Do you know if they updated the computer rooms since then? No, they well, they probably had, but they were still on the um, what they called the B. I can't remember the manufacturer. They're not your generic, um, you know, Hewlett Packard computers or your other computers. They were the like corporate school contractor type computers. Which were again very, very basic, very basic packages on there. You know, so if you want to inspire children to learn all these newfangled things in the world, it looks like the classrooms were not the place to do it. No, in a lot of cases, yeah, I'd agree with that. In both our cases, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't even learn proper script on some of these computers. But there's this government incentive about, oh, start learning script start learning you know code and all these things but you know i can imagine all the proper private schools having decent equipment and decent stuff but all these practical kids that are like wanting to do these things and willing to do these things have got no tools to do it so um i went on to college uh, after school obviously it was the sort of next stage of the journey in my learning as it was. Went on to do the furniture design and manufacturing course. It was a sort of a new college that was set up in Oxpens and it moved from Tame. Pretty much everything was new. Uh, new staff, new methods of teaching. Obviously some of the practical things were still there and the machines were still there and nothing else there, but it sort of the teachers were learning at the same pace as the students and how they should, you know, set out courses and other things. 
so everyone was learning together yeah the teachers were learning how to you know be in the building and how to coordinate the students and what the lesson setting out was but um also some of the software packages uh, students were learning at the same pace as the teachers were but it's, it goes back to this whole thing you know you get that session in college where they call it was it self studies is it self studies i don't remember what was it about you know in your music class you had this like hour session of where you could just jam did you just get like a session where you could just jam oh we had yes yeah, specifics uh like sessions where we had to go in the practice rooms and do music because half of the course was to do with performance so you did actually yeah. that was actually scheduled out it wasn't like uh i'll go do what you want you did actually have to you were supposed to go and play music at that point yeah well uh, ours was we had um sort of we had lessons which were sort of scripted sort of set out and then we had this free period which was just like um they called it self-studies Okay. And uh, you could either catch up on previous coursework or um, start doing new coursework or start practicals. You're sort of free to do whatever. So, it was, so it was, that was pretty handy, actually, because uh, the pub was a very good place to study <laughs> at that point. And uh, we had some very good pub facilities around uh, at Oxpens. We did as well. But, um, <laughs> yeah, they had a place called, what was that place called? You talk about checkers. In the one in the car park was it checkers? Oh no, that the other one. Oh, I can't remember what that was called. Anyway, you could go get a pint and a portion of chips for like two pound fifty or something like that. It's like ha- kids' happy hour. Yeah. So a p- pint of Foster's, portion of chips, set you out for the machining days. That was good. Back yeah. to woodwork on the sharp tools. I think checkers did a pint and burger for five pounds or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they used to, uh, lunchtime deals were pretty good. Yeah. What were you saying? You would go back on the machines afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but basically, that's what we did. But um, what I sort of <laughs> trying to get at is a lot of it was sort of self-education. Mm. The teacher could only take you to a point where you were then, you'd almost hit the ceiling of, you know, what could be learned from the teachers or from the course and everything therefore after if you wanted to progress properly you then have to go out and actually do yourself oh okay so it was like they literally gave you a couple of the key bits and then it was down to you to actually put the whole puzzle together with like only two pieces that sounds good though did that um teach like self-reliance well yeah again yeah a lot of it was literally self-reliance and you had to be self-determined in like a woodwork course. If you had a an attitude where you were slightly slack and you just sort of go, oh, just wing it, it just didn't happen. You could see. Could you tell who the wingers were and who were the pros? Yeah, pretty much. But the pro people... Or the, the soon-to-be pros, should I say. Yeah, the, the pro people sort of stepped the game up for the uh, the people sort of stepping behind and lagging behind. Like, you know, you sort of had something to aim for, which is a totally different... It's a bit like... Do you remember when we were talking about a school mm. where, like, we had the double DT and then you had the odd geezer that was trading behind blocking sinks yeah. and then the rest of the class was like, no, that ain't good. <laughs> it, it, it was a bit like that in college. Oh, okay. You know, so the idea of the group mentality is they want to achieve, they want to learn, they want to progress, and it's costing them a lot of money to progress. So the group mentality is that we all are going to do that, and the person that is leading behind either comes with us as a group effort, or, you know, they literally drop out. As a mentality, as a group, you know, as a, as a supportive network, like most of people actually went along with that and actually progressed in that. So college in that respect, from a social sp- perspective and how to work in amongst people of different skill levels was probably better than maybe the subject itself. Mm. Yeah. 
I think that's probably what I gained more out of college is um, how to mix in amongst all these different skill levels and still achieve something great at the end of it. Oh, that's cool. Did you prefer college, uh, school or university? Well, actually, your university was at the same place as your college, wasn't it? So did it kind of yeah. mold into one or is there a distinct sort of difference between the two you found either socially or the sort of things you were learning? No, uh, just uh, obviously new people came in in the, in the uni side of it. College was quite funny in the fact that, my God, we got up to a quite a lot of crazy shit. Um, <laughs> and school on the same respects um, was good. Secondary school was good. All the rest of the past schools were rubbish. So what, what I found cool and interesting about school is sort of the mentality that I had at the time. Because um, we could still go out and get absolutely spangled. We could still go out to the pubs or go to a field and go have a laugh and do all these interesting, weird things. But, like, I was still mentally, willingly trying to do my own crafty things. So, at the time, was that uh, because you saw the financial implications to doing that or that's just what you were drawn to i just enjoyed it mm. you know like i think we've talked about this before like in in gcse art i would go to um to do my coursework i'd go to some of those, those bases that i built those tree houses all those little dens those little hideaway spots and i'd be doing my coursework solely around painting those scenes or drawing those scenes the places we visit or like you know all that sort of side of my life so it's a it's like a, a way of mentally capturing the moment mm. and putting it on paper for sure was it your GCSE coursework was just the view of out of like a sort of it was almost like an underground pipe yeah it's a massive drainage pipe that was under a bridge and we used to go there to shelter out the rain because of great British weather <laughs> <laughs> and uh it'd be like a little cozy spot it was clean it was brand spanking new this pipe you know and like we could sit there for hours and i'd take my sketchbook and like, a couple of guys would go down there and i'd be drawing these pictures while the other guys were chatting and whatever and like um it was good I mean, it was, um, escapism at its best, really. Do you generally like being outside or you find outside more interesting to draw or a bit of both? I like, uh, I like being outside. I don't like drawing outside. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, just because it's um, quite technical. There's a lot going on, especially if you're drawing like woods or like a field. <laughs> yeah, a lot, there's a lot going on. You know, it takes hours. <laughs> <laughs> but it got certain amount of hours to live you know what i mean mm. um no but capturing those moments i think is the most important part and actually deciding what you do with those moments is probably the most important part when i look back and actually think about those points in time they're probably the fondest moments that i have actually just being able to chill out do some drawings like be with mates and then, you know, the other stuff we also did. <laughs> you know, it was pretty cool. And yeah, I remember doing uh, my coursework up in a tree with Ian, like sketching out our little den. And like, it was pretty cool. And um, I think that, that sort of mentality set me up for college and then therefore after. Yeah. So college, again, we were like, there's a, remember the coven. Yeah, yeah, he used to love it. So um, it was sort of techno, drum and bass, like early 2000s, late 2000s, well, early 2000s, it wasn't early 2008, 2009. Yeah, it would have been 2007 because I left for uni in 2008. Yeah, so okay, 2007, 2008. So we could go get absolute messy at the weekends and like there's loads of us from the college going there. And like all sorts of things were happening. I remember losing my life there and then coming back to reality at one point. <laughs> no, I got, oh, I'll tell you that story. But anyway, that sort of <laughs> that mentality of uh, being able to go do that 
and then on the Monday going back to college and having the mentality of just being going right I actually enjoy this I actually want to do that I want to get my head down and you know produce something and actually get something down on paper or get something made that's good so you had a good separation between like weekend and sort of what you needed to do in the week this week was still messy that's not (laughs) they they stripped down the pub and go back to woodwork oh my god they were still messy it's messy you got your fingers really isn't it (laughs) yeah yeah but like being able to actually have something to engage with and enjoy i think that's a hardest thing to find in life is to find that point where you actually fit in and merge in but once you find it you know it's the right thing and you just go along with it even if all those other messy things around you are still messy when you go back to the thing you enjoy you know it takes you back and sort of it's like a meditation in Mm. some respects it makes sense yeah Oh, that's cool. But anyway, uh, that thing about um, the covenant. So uh, what happened was it was a what was it a weekend after college? So we went out on the Friday, maybe. Or no, it was a Saturday. As always. Was I there? Uh, you, I think you were inside. I remember turning up with James, and I may have lost myself. I did lose myself. So um, first introduction to drugs was a very messy one. Oh, okay. This is one for you kids to learn by the older generation. Um, Are you able to say what drug it was? <laughs> yeah, well, it was um, ecstasy, it was pure. This is the most important thing. <laughs> you need the right guidance from the right people, not twits who think they know it all and trying to boast, because that just ends up at all, all kinds of wrong. I bought this stuff. I went to Sainsbury's, got a bottle of vodka, and uh, I had half an hour to kill before the queue started going in, in the cabin. So I decided to drink the bottle of vodka. Well, it was only like a 75 oh, God. mil bottle of vodka. I downed the whole thing. They still pack a punch. Yeah, <laughs> did. Then I had a gram of Mandy, and I was told to split into three. And I did two-thirds before I got into the queue. <laughs> and I gave the other third to uh, my mate. And I got in there. You know, the vibes go in... Um, you know, pumping and whatever. I got down to the dance floor. I was the only person on the dance floor. It just hit me instantly. Oh, God. And I just blanked out. Was it a nice experience or not? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. Oh, wow. What I remember, right, yeah. is uh, putting my head in the speaker, <laughs> having some fun, and then the next thing, I was blanked out. Like, I came to on the dance floor. Yeah. And uh, I dance away. All these people look at me like I'm sort of crazy, man. I was wearing this white shirt. And then the lights came on. Because literally, I came to like a half an hour before closing or whatever. So you literally just don't remember anything. Yeah. And then uh, I was trying to find my phone and wallet and keys and stuff. And what had happened, I went out of the fire exit. I must have rolled around on the floor for about an hour or two hours or whatever. <laughs> in the dirt, in a white shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then came to on the dance floor. And uh, I was like, James, I've lost everything. He goes, oh, you might have gone out of the fire exit. I was like, all oh, right, cheers, mate. At the time, were you like, no, I didn't. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I know, you know. We go find all my stuff out the back. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Ugh. that's uh, two hours of my life I'd never get back. <laughs> oh, so important funny. lesson to learn is don't listen to peers, honestly, because like, that could have ended up so bad. All right. <laughs> That of the old uh, people trying to be clever trick. Drug, <laughs> drugs ain't clever unless you take them in the right quantities. Uh, be safe. I remember once being at the coven and I borrowed your hoodie for some reason. And then like, it was the end of the night. I had the ticket out in my hand to go get it from the cloakroom. And then just suddenly it wasn't in my hand. And I was like, oh, my God. And then I don't know if you remember this but i felt bad so i bought you another hoodie and then the next time i went there the guy who works there was like we've got your hoodie that you never collected last time <laughs> so, so i think i gave you that as well so you ended up with two hoodies uh, possibly <laughs> it was a pretty weird kind of couple of years yeah i don't even know how how much that has to do with being hammered and how much that just has to do with like not paying attention do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 
I did a course on uh, the cabin. So part of my coursework, I was doing uh, on buildings and architecture and layouts. Mm. So I did a, a section on uh, interior design of the coven. Mm. So I went there on a um, a weekend to do a uh, coursework. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird, isn't it? It was a super interesting layout, actually. Yeah, they had a sunken dance floor, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, I've and never seen upper, anything like it like anywhere else. The upper level. So it was a pretty cool place. Mm. But yeah, that sort of shut down and uh, the whole disco, sorry, techno and uh, drum bass scene sort of started fizzling out. Oh, that's a shame. But what year did it close? 2000 and... It turns, uh, changed ownership and it turned into... Um, strip club, wasn't it? Uh, strip club, yeah, for a time. And then it turned into something else and it just started, I don't know, being a bit rare. So I started avoiding it. <laughs> You didn't enjoy it. No. Uh, but anyway, so that was my college years. So quite eventful, quite fun. <laughs> but then uh, obviously it led on to the real world and reality. Yeah. But uh, I think I did quite reasonably well to actually get a steady job. Yeah, I reckon so. The thing is, like, job sort of is quite soul-destroying. If you're not in the right industry or with the right people or, you know, in a place where you can actually nurture what you have. If it's just a take, 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 and that's all the business does, is just you put in your labour and you have to do your hours and, you know, the expectation is you have to work really, really hard for your wage, mm. then it can actually be quite soul-destroying for anyone. I think that's the main reason why I got back into art. Oh, okay. Are you finding your current career path a little bit tedious is that what you're saying uh yeah so my industry is quite involved um so we design and make furniture on a regular basis um from start to finish fitted wardrobes that are all bespoke nothing's the same nothing's repeated it's all different i'd start off with i was a cabinet maker so i, I was making these cabinets based on drawings and obviously it's quite you know you'd have to do quite a lot and it's quite labor intensive to then at the end of the week to get stuff complete and then uh you want to the next week you know the weekends were very short and the weeks were very long and the downtime you didn't get no downtime so between you know nine to five week and then you got the weekend where you had to do the bills you had to do your other things. You barely got time to meet friends and socialise and do everything. So it was a total change to college. And then going into, um, I sort of progressed in my career, moved up from the woodwork to the drafting side and the design side. And then you uh, met a whole different scenario of problems. What was the problems? So you deal with um, designers and interior designers and architects and a lot of these firms and people were let's be polite not putting their all into a certain project oh okay so you'd end up finding a lot of problems that you have to resolve yourself because it's your duty um to get it done and resolved and get the product out the door so you're, you know, rapidly designing all this stuff, very quickly designing all this stuff. Mm. And you'd have to produce drawings and instructions, you know, that were equivalent to making a Mini Cooper from BMW. You know what I mean? It was, uh, it was that level of detail on some of this stuff. And you have to get it all signed off from this, that, the other. By the end of the week, you're sort of exhausted. And so you find a lot of your job... Is trying to chase up like stuff that's been outs outsourced. No, they're outsourcing to us. Oh, I see. So okay. we are the outsourcer, um, but we have to chase them for details that they haven't thought about, mm. or problems that are on site, or the fact that they're delayed on site. You're, you're constantly firefighting. That's annoying. So it's not a clean, clear path. Even if your element is fine and clear, yeah, 
by the time the project gets on site and then gets installed, there's something that's gone wrong either from the architectural point or the designer point or something else has not been checked. And uh, you end up, you know, with very annoyed end clients. Do you find there's a certain amount of stubbornness from people who don't necessarily know everything that you know uh, but want it a certain way but you can't provide it because the physics just doesn't add up? Basically. Yeah. Basically. I mean, you can do any, pretty much anything in wood within reason, but um, there's a lot of aspects that come into that that mean certain things can't be done. And it's, again, it's down to communication of trying to show that person that if you go down this route, this is what happens. If you go down this route, this is what happens. And then uh, it's uh, constantly trying to prove yourself to these people that have been in the industry for years that should know certain aspects of their own job. And you sort of firefight with them and you end up slightly irritating them, even though you're trying to get the best job for them. They think you're just being like pedantic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But at the end of the day, if I delivered a job that didn't physically work or wasn't fit for purpose, then the whole job would be scrapped at our expense rather than having this conversation of what can be or can't be done or what should be done. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so uh, that sounds frustrating. Yeah, at the end of the week, it's quite soul destroying, which is why I'm I got back into my art. Oh, okay. So you do still like your job, but it's certain aspects make you annoyed by it, and also it's led you on to pursuing an artistic career outside of work as well, which is a good thing, really. Yeah, I think what you need to look at in the whole broad scheme of things is. Unless your work fits around you as a person and you can control large aspects of that, if it doesn't, then you need to find, well, I had to find my own pocket of, you know, relief. Of, sanity. You know, sanity. Because otherwise you just, you end up, melting you end up blowing up you end up dying inside yeah so uh it's, it's quite important on your in on any journey of anyone's journey of self learning or whatever to if they do get to that point to start really critically thinking about what can be done what can't be done how do i go forward instead of just melting away and exploding or dying inside, you know, looking at options. What can I do at the weekends that will give me that freedom back? What can I do at, you know? They'll bring some enjoyment back to your life. <laughs> yeah, so art uh, is that. The other thing critically I did hmm. was because I got to a point in my career where I was comfortable with my level of knowledge, and I think people started to see, like, how good I was with certain aspects of my job. It started opening up new doors. So um, I decided to quickly go down to a four day a week rather than five days a week. Oh, okay. The reason for that, I wanted to concentrate on my art, mm. but I also wanted to have Fridays off to actually be able to heal in some respects. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, to reconnect. Are you taking a pay cut at all for not doing the extra day or you're just catching up with the other work while you're at work? Well, that's it. I I made an agreement where I did the 40 hours in the four days and then uh, the fifth day I'll get off. But the only reason I was able to do that, because I worked so hard and because I strive to do the best I can, uh, I was able to you know, use my knowledge and use that stuff as the reason why I could do that. You're almost pointing to the importance of uh, competence and that competence given you leverage over setting your own yeah. working hours or whatever it is. Most people 
won't experience that, I don't think. It depends what job and career you're in. I mean, you do have, I mean, employees' rights. You do have some rights. Mm. Um, obviously, in retail, it can be a lot different. But, you know, some retail and some places will give you that freedom. And obviously, the bigger chains are very strict where the smaller run family businesses have flexibility Mm. so it's where you want to fit into this complex world yeah i mean once you become valuable enough to the company then you sort of get to set some of your own rules i guess is that a good way of putting it yeah well to a certain level obviously don't you can't take the piss no but to a certain level you can and uh, the other thing is, there's no harm in moving about from firm to firm if you feel uncomfortable with where you're at. So that can also help you and give you freedoms that you wouldn't necessarily have. So uh, that's what I found. I mean, I've moved three, four different places, but I kept in the same industry. And what I strive to do is make sure that the industry I was in, I learned as much as I could do the best i could so when i go to the next place i was already had that nod forward so then as soon as i hit the ground you could see i was more than competent and i gave me additional freedom so uh, i guess you didn't burn any bridges with any of the places you left so that then builds you a good reputation is that right uh it's important to not burn your bridges yeah but sometimes it's impossible not to oh just because some people won't take you leaving as well as others yes so uh as much as you don't want to try and burn your bridges sometimes it's just the bridges burn themselves yeah the bridges just burn themselves but um there's no harm in if you've done nothing wrong to reconnect with those businesses at a later date once they've sort of come to terms put the fire up yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. you know what i mean so uh but the critical thing is i gained a bit of my life back and i was able to then do what I wanted personally which was the main part of my journey as it were which is now art okay you were like pursuing uh freelance furniture for a while are you still doing any of that yeah um anything art or design related I'm still doing so uh I mean I do landscape design work on the side as well as uh, burnt design work on the side. I mean, I was doing drawings for car parks for like places like Westgate at one point, and I'm sort of oh, fucking still doing bits and bobs like that. The good thing about some skills is they're transferable. Like the skill set that I have are infinitely transferable, and in any industry, you will pick stuff up and you will learn stuff that you can take in any other places and. The critical part of my journey is what those things are and what I can use for tools for other things. So, uh, yeah, I still do the furniture design. Uh, I mean, I've just completed a fitted wardrobe for a friend uh, on the sideline. Um, but, you know, it's all part of the my grand scheme of things, of being a artist designer. Is there a point you'd ever see yourself going fully self-employed? Uh, I need, obviously, the amount of work to increase to be able to switch over. So um, at the moment, the uh, my part-time is paying the bills. And then my private work is that additional funds that then enable me to do any other interesting projects oh that's cool so what you got coming up and where can people see your work or buy your furniture or buy your art so this year has been a pretty crazy year hasn't it Mm. the old 2020 and how have you been dealing with lockdown uh yeah that's an interesting one so um the art world um was pretty much a wipeout for pretty much everyone in the art industry everything and during lockdown went virtual so online exhibitions online talks podcasts like we're doing now um all those sort of virtual 
orientated digital internet avenues were sort of taken advantage of. If anything, this year's been a great learning curve because it's shown that there's another opportunity out there to reach a larger audience through uh, other means. So uh, I don't take 2020 as a, a rubbish year, although I would have preferred to drink wine in a gallery <laughs> while I was looking at some paintings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Did you have a gallery set up that got cancelled? Yeah, I had an exhibition set up for May of this year. Oh, shit. That was uh, put on hold because we were in the midst of the largest lockdown. But we went virtually for that month, and then we reopened the gallery during the July period when it was opened again. But we're still restricted numbers, so the gallery wasn't really at a big event as, as it should have been. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, so um, it's an interesting learning curve, but you know, it's still knowledge and still learnt something out of it. And then um, going forth, I'm you know I'm still painting away, still doing commissions and artwork. And then uh, plan to you know relaunch in 2021 with some new things. You know, new artworks and just build on what I've learned from previous years. Oh, nice. So like what, what inspires you artistically? Everything inspires me artistically. Is there any artists or is it mainly like the environment? Uh, environment mainly. I like, you know, I like walking along and just spotting something that no one else has seen and just thinking, you know, that's actually pretty epic. You know, and just taking a moment to absorb things in I think life's quite important and uh, as those points in life those unexpected points in life that need to be absorbed and you know looked at and art is a great capture of some of those moments so I thought you were going to keep talking <laughs> <laughs> I was getting into that. Art's a weird world, but it's taking the time to uh, just actually kick back and relax, you know, and just enjoy those moments. Nice. What kind of um, feedback have you got for your art? I mean, uh, I've got loads of great. I'm not on Facebook mm. and on, uh, on Instagram. I've got, I get loads of really good feedback on all my artworks and projects that I do. Um, my artwork's totally, well, I don't know what you call it. I mean, it's quite unique in the aspect of what I do. I don't know if you still do, but you have had like a mix of realism with, you had quite like thick black outlines as well, which was really interesting. Do you still draw in that same way or have you changed your style since then? So the important part of me being an artist and developing as an artist was to find my style and to find my place and uh, I came across this concept wild in thought and um, it was basically using that black outlines to frame sections of my paintings and it all goes back to my um, sort of my thoughts and mentality of deconstruction and then reconstruction of things all our aspects of things building up to make a greater picture. So the reason why I outline elements of my paintings in a big, thick black line is one, to draw your eye into that section of the painting, but to two, to show you how that one part added with all the rest builds up a greater picture. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, again, it goes back to my logic of, you know, the draftsman, uh, a cabinet maker, you know, being hands-on, being creative and deconstruction and reconstructing things. That's sort of uh, why it, where it came about. And also heavily influenced by, you know, um, the pre-Raphaelite movement as well as uh, stained glass art. Oh, I totally see stained glass, actually, yeah. Yeah, so again, the method of making a stained glass window is you take one element... You have to 
use that one element to build up a bigger picture because you cannot, in a larger stained glass window, have all this stuff together because you just can't physically build a window that way. Ah, interesting. Have you ever made one before? No, but I, um, I mean, I used to go to church quite often on Sundays with my partner and I used to just sit and gaze up at the uh, stained glass windows and just be in awe at the fact that you know, the light will shine through these individual painted panels um, and then be framed by this thick, darker outline. That's true, actually. If you go to church, in my experience anyway, the, the actual sermon isn't the interesting part. There's the architecture of the building and then there's the stained glass windows, as you say. And I just love, as an older person, I'm not that old, but I fucking love how churches look which is not saying I used to as much when I was a child. Yeah, the architecture, they t- you know, t- took a lot of time and effort into building these things and, you know, a lot of thought and preparation went into how they looked. So, uh, I mean, Gothic architecture, uh, neoclassical architecture, um, you know, and then some of the sort of design aspects of some of the moderner versions like uh, Art Deco and, you know, um, all those things. I love I love design as a whole and I love how they, all these elements mix together. So uh, it's an interesting world we live in, but I was just making sure that I capture as much beauty as possible in the time I have. Hey, thanks for listening and thank you to Jay for joining me. Check out his work at jcclayton.co.uk and go find him on Instagram at j.c.clayton and at facebook.com forward slash jcclaytonartist. If you like the show, then tell your friends and that's it. Bye. Bye.